it's, uh, it's fantastic to be here. I have to admit, it's not very common for me to feel like I have to turn up my enthusiasm level to match the room, but Scott really set the, uh, the standard for us. Uh, I know that there's a diversity of backgrounds for all of you in the audience, and so in this talk, what I want to do is try and give some high-level insights about what is the challenge associated with navigation and why it matters. But I also want to show those of you who are familiar with this, what is the actual state of the art? What are some of the most advanced things that are happening right now? And give you understanding of how real this, this actually is. Now, if you're not familiar with Q-Control, we're a company that focuses on how software can enable hardware. And our work spans two primary uh, business verticals. One of them that you may have heard a little bit about from Jay Gambetta's talk this morning is quantum computing, where we build performance management infrastructure software that makes the computers perform thousands of times better. Uh, as a native New Yorker, it was a great honor to have the, uh, the NASDAQ wall at our announcement uh, last year in Times Square. Uh, and we're very proud for all the partnerships we have across the ecosystem. But in addition, we've taken that same perspective, how software can fix the problems of hardware to this other vertical, that is quantum sensing, using quantum systems to detect the environment. And in this particular area, I'm gonna focus on the issue of what we do when there's no GPS and how you can solve it using quantum sensing. Now, this is the satellite that we were just talking about. This is one of the GPS satellites. And what's actually quite inspiring to me is that this is the first demonstration of a true quantum technology. This is a technology where we're using a quantum sensor, a quantum sensor for time, in order to allow us to position ourselves. The challenge with this has become so ubiquitous that it's now a major risk to us. And just a couple of months ago in the New York Times, I'm sorry, I know we're at an Economist event, but the New York Times ran the big article. It's being identified by not just governments, not just departments of defense, but by mainstream media, that there is a new risk emerging associated with our over-reliance on global positioning. Now, this is something that in various industries has been known for a long time. This is a map of the Middle East, and that heat map is an area identified by IATA, which manages international air transit, identifying areas where GPS is not trusted, where someone is interfering with the navigation signal that aircraft typically rely on. And just in the last couple of weeks, we saw major incidents with, say, Finnair flights that had to turn around from their pathway to, uh, in this case, try to land in Estonia because they were being denied GPS. There was active interference with the signal that they were using for navigation. Now, as many of you know, GPS has not always been there. There have been navigation technologies that existed before GPS. We, they take many different flavors. One of them is called inertial navigation, using measurements of motion in order to position yourself. Every naval surface vessel, every naval subsurface vessel, I won't say the S word, all of them have inertial navigation systems. The challenge is that the conventional technology is just not very stable. And over time, the instability of the detectors for motion lead to an accumulation of positioning uncertainty. So what that means in practice is that while it may not be too big of a deal if you're in the open ocean and the weather is great and you can see, over the see all the way to the horizon, uh, in just about eight hours with a typical device, your positioning uncertainty is roughly a mile. If the weather is inclement, if it's dark, if the waters are poorly charted, what you can see from this particular example is that that can lead to catastrophic outcomes. Now, the angle that we're taking is to address this fundamental challenge in the way you have to navigate without GPS. And we look to the quantum properties of atoms in order to give us a path to build resilient navigation systems. We like using atoms for this because they give us many different signals that we can measure relevant to navigation. I'll tell you about them in some more detail. The first is acceleration. You can measure motion. Atoms have mass. Mass times acceleration is a force. You can feel that motion. But atoms can also be used to measure gravity. They can be dropped and they fall under gravity and you can measure that. In addition, many of us know that you can measure magnetic fields. The atoms have little spins inside like compass needles. 
in a cartoon fashion, and we can measure these ambient magnetic signals. You can do all of it with the same kind of technology. And we know that quantum sensors have already demonstrated quantum advantage. They're already better at sensing these technologies, for the most part, than the classical canonical technologies that are in the field today. The problem is when you take them out of the lab, they break. They just fail. And the objective that we've taken here is to say, how can we fix that problem to take the laboratory quantum advantage demonstrations for quantum sensing out onto real moving platforms, onto boats, onto aircraft, in order to get the full benefits of what we're trying to do. And of course, as you know, we do that with software. And we're very proud that last year we were able to announce a partnership with, uh, with an AUKUS with the Australian Department of Defense and more recently with both DASA and OCTO in the UK, where our quantum sensors are becoming a core part of a resilient GPS backup among AUKUS nations. Again, this was featured in the New York Times uh, in July last year. Now here, we're building miniaturized quantum sensors. We're leveraging software in a way that lets us make the devices smaller without giving up performance. And we've made three major categories of device. The first is the world's smallest strap-down three-axis quantum inertial measurement unit. I told you I would say some things for the experts in the room. The next is a quantum dual gravimeter, and the last is an optical magnetometer. Each of those measures those three different signatures that I mentioned before. But remember, the idea is not just making it smaller, the idea is making it work in the field. And this is where everything in the world conspires against you. When you take a quantum sensor out of the lab, you typically give up a thousand X in performance. And that's because you have hardware imperfections that come when you miniaturize from reduced swap. You have environmental clutter, there's all sorts of sources of interference, and you have what's called platform noise. Everything vibrates on a diesel engine powered naval vessel. All of those things conspire, and that's what we work to fix, and we do it with software. Now, the software we use to ruggedize the devices instead of doing a purely hardware approach, it comes in two core categories. The first at the bottom there is the operational software. We actually change the way you perform the measurements to make them more resilient against all of these sources of degradation. The other part is in the data processing. How do you take the signatures out of the device and process them in a way that gives you useful information even when there is all this clutter, even when there is all, this, uh, all these sources of degradation? Now, just I'll give you some examples of these. Here's one. This is a, a bit of technical work that we did and published at the end of last year. What we're doing in this particular case is leveraging what's called an atom interferometer. It's a device that we can use, in this case, to measure gravity by dropping atoms and manipulating them with laser pulses in a particular way. But the big source of degradation is that when the whole thing moves, the atoms just fall out of the laser beam. And if they're not in the laser beam, they can't be measured. That source of degradation in this particular plot shows that when you turn up the shaking that we're doing to the device, we're actually uh, emulating vibrations on this, you just get loss of signal. But when you turn on our software, which implements what's called robust control, the signal comes back. This gives a difference of about 20x enhancement of environmental tolerance purely with a software approach to the operating mode. And that's allowed us to do some really cool things. This is our three-axis quantum inertial measurement unit on a motion profiler that is emulating the motion that would be experienced in C-state 3 for a naval frigate. That motion that you see is actually playing a profile that comes from real known motion of naval vessels. And we can show that adding these kinds of software enablement in operation make this device continue to work even while in motion. It really continues to function. That's the accelerometer, but I promised you more insight into what is the state of the art. Just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we ran the world's first field trial of a mobile quantum dual gravimeter. That is a gravimeter that measures while in motion. I want to disambiguate here. There's a difference between something portable that you pick up and you put down and you back away gingerly and then you let it measure and something that is mobile. That is, it operates in motion. This is the first time a dual gravimeter has ever been operated in motion. And you can see one of our colleagues operating on a maritime vessel in literal waters. 
This device operates uh, at state-of-the-art levels at the micro G per root hertz level. It continues to preserve that performance while it's in motion. Nano G, for those of you who care what this, uh, what this means, baseline sensitivity. But the really interesting thing here is the swap. This is a system designed for a platform that is battery operated, and as a result, how much power it consumes is a huge deal. Now, if any of you have seen a quantum physics lab, it tends to be full of stuff, lots and lots of stuff, and all that stuff consumes a lot of power, typically thousands of watts, many kilowatts of power. This device currently operates at 180 watts, and the next design iteration is under 100, which is less power than an incandescent light bulb. The whole thing all the lasers, all the electronics, and the quantum sensor head. In the last few minutes, I wanted to talk about one more part of the narrative. Remember, there were three things, acceleration, gravity, and magnetic fields. There's another approach to navigation that we can use, whereby we can navigate using geophysical beacons. Instead of getting a signal from a satellite, we can just look at a map. You do it. I, any of you who got here looking at your phone, we're, we're doing map matching. You were looking at buildings, you were looking at street signs, and you were positioning yourself based on the signals you were getting from looking around and comparing to a map. You can do the same thing with other signatures. You can do that with magnetic fields. Earth's magnetic field is not constant everywhere in space. And so in the mining industry, there is a huge amount of effort that goes into mapping magnetic field variations because that's tied to what mineral deposits exist. Well, we have this incredibly small, low-power optical magnetometer, and we can now use that in order to do magnetic navigation. Now, before we actually start flying these devices, and we are flying them this year, the starting point is, well, what can software do for us? And to understand that, we can look at a really exciting challenge called the MIT MagNav Challenge. This is a dual project from MIT and the Department of Defense in the United States which has flown magnetometers over a, a part of uh, southern Canada. And in that particular experiment, they had a huge number of sensors, many magnetometers. They had a well-known map. They actually had GPS, so they knew exactly where they were. They had all sorts of other sensors, things that told you the role of the aircraft and whatnot. And they just gave a dump. Take all this data. Tell me what you can do with it. Remember, they're giving you real magnetometer signals and the map. The problem is this. These are real data from that MagNav challenge. The actual measured signal has a thousand times more noise than the geomagnetic signature they're looking for. It's just dominated by all of the aircraft motion and the engines and all the electronics and avionics. It kills you. So the first question is, can you use software to see through this noise? That's the MagNav challenge. And so we've done this. This is the best public demonstration, we don't know what we don't know, of course. Scott may know something. This is the best public demonstration of noise reduction, where what you can see is taking that horrible noisy signal, we can filter it with software in such, using all the other signals in such a way that we can what, do what's called denoising. We can reduce the noise. And you can see how the output effectively gets rid of all that fluctuation and just leaves us with the signal we're looking for. Importantly for the experts, this does not require any pre-training. It does not require the aircraft to do any special maneuvers. It is a live runtime filter that updates itself and removes the noise. But we can go further than that because we can actually do full simulated navigation. And in this particular case, we showed over this four hour flight window that we could reduce the positioning uncertainty. Again, this is simulated based on those data. You can reduce the positioning uncertainty to just 75 meters RMS variation, as opposed to what you can see being off by about a kilometer if you were doing pure inertial navigation. This, the idea that you can do magnetic navigation, you can actually remove the platform noise, and you can use these very, very small magnetometers that only consume three watts of power and they're low cost, that enables something totally new. It enables the ability to envision a new approach for long duration autonomous missions in places where you don't have great features over the ocean, where there are no landmarks to look for, at high latitudes where GPS does not exist or is not trusted. It's a really exciting new opportunity that comes from this form of resilient quantum navigation. 
So if you'd like to learn more about the work that we do, the sensors that we build, and the many partnerships we have, I'd encourage you to please uh, check out our website. And I'm very happy if we have any time to take any questions. Thank you.